Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Explorers Forum. Um, it's Memorial Day. I'm reluctant to say happy Memorial Day because it's not really a happy holiday as far as I'm concerned, but I hope you're having a safe and healthy one, nevertheless. Our guest this morning, uh, as we wrap up our clergy conversation series, is the Reverend Dr. John Walton, who many of you may know was at uh, our neighbor church up the street, Westminster Presbyterian, uh, for uh, 17, 18 years, and then spent a like amount of time at First Presbyterian in New York. So we've gotten a little bit of a late start this morning, and we're just going to, you know, not stop at 11:45. We'll, we'll, we won't, uh, we won't shorten the time frame at all, but um, we'll get right into it. And I think um, this may be a little bit off topic from from what we've talked about before, John. But what I wanted to start with was the fact that you preached your first sermon in New York on September 9th, Sunday, September 9th, and two days later. Um, there was a big event in New York, and I wonder if um, if you could just share what that experience was like. You were new to living in New York, new to being in that church. You were uh, fewer than two miles away from the World Trade Center. Um, you were in a part of Manhattan that was closed for a number of weeks. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about what that experience was like? Certainly a horrible way to start off your relationship with that church and that neighborhood, and you were part of New York that was closed below 14th Street there for many weeks. So just talk about what that was like and how that informed your, your time there. Sure. Um, I remember that my first Sunday there on September 9th, um, I ended the sermon. It was my first you know introductory sermon to the congregation other than the candidating sermon. And uh, I remember saying to um, the congregation as at the end of the sermon, who knows where God will lead us in the coming time, but here we go on this adventure together, and uh, we have a great companion in Jesus Christ. Um, well, little did I know that uh, the two days later, we were going to be in the midst of uh, a terrible time in our nation and in, certainly in New York as well. Um, I was uh, getting ready for the day on the 11th, and uh, I heard on the radio that a plane had gone into one of the towers of the uh, World Trade Center. And I thought, well, that's really strange. I don't think, you know, that could be an accident. Somehow I think this is sabotage. And by the time I said, well, I said to myself, I need to get down to the church to see what you know, what's going on down there. Um, we were a bit north of the World Trade Center, of course, uh, about 12 to, well, something like 20 blocks, I think. But in New York, um, those avenue um, blocks are short ones. And um, by the time I had walked from 7th Avenue to 6th Avenue, the second plane had gone into the World Trade Center uh, tower. So sure enough, um, when I got down to the church, um, things had, had really, you know, I was surprised north of where I live, uh, people were not very attentive to what was happening. But when I got down to the 12th street where the church was located, uh, I did in fact see a lot of, well, traffic pulling over onto the side of the road. Um, a lot of ambulances and fire engines and that sort of thing. So when I got inside the church, um, one of the custodians uh, said to me, Dr. Walton, that plane flew right over this building. And he said the windows in the stained glass windows in the sanctuary rattled. So um, I asked them to the uh, custodians if they would open up the church and allow people who were starting to flow up Fifth Avenue to come into the sanctuary and um, so that they would have a place where they could rest and uh, catch their breath, um, which they did. And, and someone brought a woman to my office and said that she needed to use the telephone. And I was talking with her, she said, um, her mother and her sister were supposed to meet her at the World Trade Center. 
uh, and she was concerned about them. Um, as it turned out, uh, her mother and sister were safe, but in talking with her, I said, you know, you're welcome to use the phones or the restrooms, whatever you need. Um, and I said, where are you from? And she said, Wilmington, Delaware. So I took it as a sign that <laughs> I was in the right place after all. So um, I think the, the long and short of it is that the, the church really swung into action. Deacons started showing up, elders started showing up, people asking what they could do to help. Basically, we just needed people to spend time and, and kind of help with people who were coming up this, the avenue stunned, covered in smoke and in ash, and uh, really very concerned about, you know, family and, and what they could do. We lost eight members of the congregation that day, uh, including two Sunday school teachers, uh, wife of my secretary, or the husband of my secretary, um, a police officer, John Perry, um, and the president, the father who was president of the nursery school. So, it, I mean, it, it just, uh, there was a, another custodian of a member of the family of one of our custodians who was also killed that day. So it, it really affected the life of the congregation. I had planned for a preaching series to kind of introduce myself and uh, to touch on issues in my theology uh, I thought would be important to kind of be building blocks with the congregation. Well, all that went out the window immediately. We started having evening services every night that week. I remember um, Ernest Campbell uh, preached on Friday night and uh, he had been the pastor at the Riverside Church in New York. And I remember him saying what really galls me is that this is my town <laughs> um, as if anybody could claim it in that way but um, you know he he just uh, brought it down to a, a high level and and you got the impression that he uh, he was taking this personally I think for the first five years or so in our new member classes people would say um, I started coming at 9-11, and I have never stopped going. Um, so it, it had a profound effect on us, uh, certainly immediately in the following years. And it was probably five or six years into being pastor at First Church that um, one of my associates and I always led the new member classes. And I turned to him and said, uh, this is the first time in five years that someone in the group has not said, I started coming at 9-11 and never stopped. Hmm. Sobering. What, what, what was the membership, um, John, from where did you, when, from where did First Church draw its members? Were they mostly people who lived close enough to walk on Sundays with, or did they... Did they come from other parts of New York or even outside? Was there, did people come from outside of Manhattan? It was a very interesting collection of people. Um, I would say predominantly people living in the village in Chelsea and um, uh, the lower part of Manhattan. Um, but we had members who drove down from Westchester County, from the New Jersey suburbs. Uh, as Hoboken became a popular town uh, across the river, um, a lot of young couples, young singles would come from Hoboken. Um, so we really, you know, covered kind of the west side below 14th Street um, and also reaching out to New Jersey and Westchester County. For the most part, people would take public transportation or walk to church. Um, we had a radio program for a while. And um, I remember uh, part of the directions about where First Church was were, were to name the bus stops. Uh, 
you can get off at Fifth Avenue and, and 12th Street, that kind of thing. So the bus stops right here. <laughs> Well, there's um, there's an interesting uh, brings up an interesting point. Um, what do you think? What do you think it was about um, your leadership or the the reputation of First Church that attracted those young people that you talked about? Well, it's uh, it's interesting. I, we lived across the street from two dormitories of NYU. Um, there was also on that corner was um, the new school. Uh, of social research is now just called the New School University. Um, and the Cardozo School of Law, which is part of the Yeshiva uh, University system. Um, and I say that because I, I really kind of expected there would be a lot of students, but um, that, was, uh, that was not true. Uh, there were faculty and um, other uh, people associated with the universities that um, would come to first, but most of them were, uh, well, I used to say that I, we have the ideal congregation. We have members who have been here for years and years and years. Um, they were the, what I would call the Mellon McNabb uh, folks. Uh, they, they were, Mellon and McNabb were two of my predecessors from the 50s, 60s, 70s. And uh, they stayed a long time. And then there were a group of people who joined probably within the, the 10 years leading up to the time I came. They were the Barry Shepherd uh, people. Um, and there were a lot of younger couples who uh, came then when, when I arrived. And I kept saying to God, why have you given me this young congregation when I'm such an old geezer at this point? Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it was uh, the kind of congregation that every, every church would like to have. There were singles, there were married people, there were uh, career people, uh, a good mix of all ages. Uh, there were about 15 or 20 in a confirmation group every other year. Um, there was a youth choir and a children's choir. Uh, we had a wonderful music program, which appealed to many people. Um, so in, in so many respects, um, it, it was kind of an ideal mix of people. At Westminster in Wilmington, um, we had about 1800 members at the time that I left. And I remember the committee on ministry, someone asking me as I was you know, being interviewed for First Presbyterian in New York. Um, how are you going to deal with a church that's so much smaller than yours? Well, um, First Church had 800 members at that time. It got up to around 1,100 uh, or so during the years I was there. But um, it, it's just the kind of a surprising mix of people. Um, and I, and I really enjoyed it. I, it kept me young, uh, <laughs> even though I was an old geezer. Uh, nonetheless, it, it really uh, kept me on my toes reading uh, kinds of things that I would, would not have otherwise been involved in or interested in. Um, so I think it's because there were, there were already a lot of people there it attracted people to come and be a part of that. Yeah, you know, what, what we've been learning as we, uh, from the work that the Transition Task Force did and as we, we continue on our search for a pastor is that when it comes to attracting young people, um, it's not so much that they're attracted by the doctrine or, or the necessarily the beliefs of any particular denomination, but they're looking for some other type of connection what do you think, what are some, what are the things that, what are the kinds of things that First and Central can do to, um, to attract people like that who are not necessarily even familiar with the Presbyterian doctrine or who may not share the entire belief system, um, but who may uh, think of themselves more as practicing Christians than believing Christians? Yeah, I, that's an interesting question. Um, 
one of the things that I and my colleagues at First Church uh, spent a fair amount of time discussing and trying to respond to was the, the fact that, um, in fact, the people who came on Christmas Eve and filled the church to overflowing, uh, people who came on Easter uh, and so on were uh, not people that we felt, you know, were not part of us and were interlopers, but uh, I think I re read an article in the uh, Christian Century in which um, they said those people that come on Christmas Eve and Easter, um, they're your parish. They are in fact your parish. They are people who feel um, and a, a connection with the church for some reason. Usually it had to do with spiritual or personal uh, crises and issues that people were going through. Um, and uh, I, would, I would tease uh, our, some of our folks about the fact that uh, we may have had an ideal congregation in terms of age mix, but the young people that came weren't very good pledgers. <laughs> we had to do a lot of educating of what a pledge is and, uh, and people live closer to the bone in New York or want to see the results of their stewardship and giving, you know, they would, would ask in a sort of crass way, uh, what am I getting for my money? Uh, that, was, that was unusual, but um, we felt, I think to a large extent, we were educating these younger folks about stewardship in the in the life of uh, the church, and it was a, um, and we had a very broad definition of membership. We didn't, re you didn't have to um, know the Book of Order back and forwards or make a profession of faith in quite the same way uh, until you were ready. You know, you maybe wanted to do that, but you do that because. Um, there were tough questions you were living through and um, people came to church for inspiration, for hope. Um, the working environment there is, is very stressful. People are very competitive. Um, they are, uh, I, I think everybody that's in New York living and working has earned a place to be there. Um, they, they have become as accomplished and uh, capable as they can be. And they feel and live with that stress and that uh, secular um, sense of uh, uh, kind of fending for yourself. I think it was hel helpful and hopeful for our members to come to a place where there was not that stress. There was not uh, that, uh, that sense of uh, uh, loneliness and isolation. Uh, I think people came because they were looking for something and they were looking for spiritual help and support. A lot of times I felt like we would welcome them into the service or welcome them into the church. Uh, they would get what they needed for the, the following week and then we'd send them out with a benediction and basically say, get out there and keep at it. Um, it that, that was the, the kind of feeling you had, I think, uh, with New Yorkers being so driven as they, as they are. Um, I mean, of course, you can't characterize a, a people um, just with one phrase, but um, people in New York were looking out for themselves, looking, but also surprisingly looking out for others. And the church gave them a place to do that. Yeah, I think it's, it's, I think it's hard for people who have not lived in New York. Most people here know that I have lived in, in Manhattan. It's hard for people to understand how you could feel a sense of isolation in a city that is so crowded full of people, but it's a, but it's a very real thing. So you talk right. about, about what drew people into first church. I'm sorry. But how, how did um, how did that um, 
maybe affect the liturgy or or affect um, your order of, of worship or your how did that maybe change what you were doing in a Sunday morning service from what a more quote unquote traditional Presbyterian church might have been doing? Well, we spent a lot of time on liturgy planning um, really months in advance. Uh, the words needed to help, um, you know, Presbyterians are very wordy uh, in worship. And um, we've really worked hard to economize on the wordiness of our service. We followed the service for the Lord's Day, but uh, we did so um, with a sense of, uh, of not a, not a, we weren't slavish to it. Um, for instance, we often had baptisms where um, one uh, uh, partner may have been Buddhist or um, not of the Christian faith, Jewish or, um, as, well, just not Christian, but the one spouse or the one, uh, one the other in the couple did want to have a Christian service. So we adapted the baptismal service to include questions that would uh, include the non-Christian member of that couple. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's one example, but we had glorious music like First and Centrals and uh, a wonderful choir, great organist, um, we emphasized music and um, put a lot of music in the service, responses and uh, uh, psalms and so on. Uh, so music played a key role, um, but there's a lot to overcome in a sanctuary that's, uh, that's as old as First Church and that has uh, pews that uh, have doors on them. I used to joke about the fact that uh, you uh, would sit in a pew and the usher would close and lock the door and you don't get out until you make a pledge. But, um, you know, it's uh, um, the, the, the sanctuary speaks to the service as well. And I think that people uh, sense that uh, feeling of, um, needing to have some holy space. And they would come into the sanctuary, be seated, pray, uh, listen to the music, listen to the preaching. Um, and uh, I think these were all things that we tried to adapt to, to make um, available and accessible to our worshipers, knowing that some were deep and profound believers of lifelong Presbyterian connections, and others had just wandered in uh, for the first time that Sunday morning. We often had as many as 50 or 75 visitors. Uh, and when you realize that people are just walking in off the street because the doors were open and they wanted to look and see what was inside, uh, and may have had no more motivation than that. Um, the key was to keep them in their seat and, and uh, standing in their uh, pew so that uh, they remained a, a part of things and continued on in the service. Uh, so what you're saying is in our next renovation, we need to add doors to the pews. <laughs> no, um, don't, I suggest you don't do that. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> Uh, what, tell me about uh, how how they tell me a little bit about the music program and how diverse it was, um, and also separate but connected is how how did you promote the uh, promote the fact that you were willing to be flexible in terms of accommodating a, a couple that perhaps one of the members was Buddhist or not Christian? How how did you promote the fact that you were a welcoming congregation to that kind of flexibility? One of the things we we did was to take the the, the um, video uh, connection with the, with the congregation out on the street. There was a fence, very much like First and Central's fence, uh, out on the street, 
And I, I first saw this at the um, Marvel Collegiate Church. Uh, they had these photographs, large blown up poster sized photographs of the congregation at worship and the congregation uh, serving meals uh, at uh, a homeless shelter. Um, so one of the things that, that we did was to, to kind of take the church outside to the street so that people could see that it was an active, vital congregation. Um, one of the impressions that we heard was that because it had a gate around it, not a gate, a fence all around it, um, it looked like it was closed. And in fact, it was um, much of the time. So we began opening the doors of the church, um, putting these large posters out on the street so that people could see the, the visibility and the liveliness of the congregation. And you can do that in a city church uh, much better than in a, a suburban congregation because you have foot traffic past the, past the church. And so those visual things were important. Um, I think uh, um, just simply, uh, ha we had some events uh, like the, um, um, we had a seniors group that met at the church and we asked them to go out on the street and stand on the steps of the church and, and do some concerts. Uh, which they loved and thought was a great idea. So, in fact, at Christmas time and um, other seasons, the, the seniors' choir would go outside on the steps and and serenade the the passersby, which was a lot of fun uh, for everybody. The music program was promoted largely through Bill Entrican, who was our organist. Um, they did a, a a fall, uh, usually Christmas, and uh, uh, springtime service, uh, concert. Bill also, this was choral concert, some major work. Bill also arranged a series of organ concerts uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of winter. And um, they were reasonably well attended. Um, then uh, we also took out advertisements on the radio uh, and promoted the church's music program uh, that way as well. When I first arrived, uh, one of the things I inherited was a uh, radio program on WQXR, the classical radio station in New York and um, radio of the New York Times, I think they call themselves. So. We had that program going on for a year or so. Uh, we were not the only uh, Christian church. Fifth Avenue uh, would trade Sundays with us at various times, uh, Fifth Avenue Presbyterian. And so did, um, so did the Unitarian Church, uh, uh, All Souls U Unitarian Church. So there was a radio presence as well, and that was, helpful uh, to us and uh, and I think a good advertisement for the music program, especially since music was part of that uh, half hour program on Sunday mornings. It eventually got so expensive and so did advertising in the New York Times that we simply had to drop that. And now I don't think there's any advertising uh, in the Times or on uh, WQXR. I want, want to go back to stewardship a little bit. Um, both at, at Westminster and at first, um, you had the challenge of a, a, of a fairly well-funded church in terms of endowment or reserve funds. Um, and how did that, how did that affect uh, stewardship and, and, and stewardship drives when people knew or people know that there is a, you know, there is money there in perpetuity that uh, may not be accessed for operations, and yet um, it's tough for the church to cry poor mouth when there's, you know, 
a lot of money sitting in the bank somewhere. How did that affect your stewardship campaigns, both at first and at Westminster? Well, uh, it's true that there are endowments at both churches. Um, but as a pastor, I was very much aware that uh, you can, if you dip into the principle of that, it can go away very quickly. Um, so we had policies to limit the amount of spending from uh, those endowments. And um, um, I, I found that stewardship was a, a crucial issue for the congregation. Um, one of the gifts and one of the problems of uh, those who have substantial means is that um, they, they worry about money and the, the church um, can, uh, can benefit from the, the generosity of uh, people who uh, support the, the congregation. Um, I would, I would mention that, that, um, I didn't preach on stewardship just in October, uh, going into the stewardship Sunday. I found that, um, that stewardship and the, the challenge of how to live responsibly with money was something that was a year round, um, occasion for uh, education. Um, I don't, uh, I wouldn't say that, uh, uh, that, it, that it was just limited to that time. It was, it was important to speak about uh, money and, and uh, about uh, the gifts that people give and so on as a part of their um, stewardship. Uh, just important to make that a year round kind of subject. I always had, uh, w when we had a successful stewardship program, um, there was always someone who was really able to um, speak to that and, and did a good job of organizing a stewardship committee. This was not something that happened just in October. It was, uh, a stewardship chair who would have a committee working all year round. And um, uh, it, it wasn't just up to me to, to raise those funds. It was up to the whole congregation. And um, so we worked hard at, at trying to do that. Um, I, I made a couple of notes um, in Setauket which was the church I served before Westminster, uh, we had a, a, a stewardship emphasis uh, during one season. And we emphasized that uh, the gifts that people give are time, talent, and treasure. Um, and so we decided that we would um, not only have a pledge dedication Sunday that year, but we would also ask people to pledge time and talents um, to serve on a committee or to help with a newspaper uh, collection drive or um, to bring um, uh, coats for um, people in need through the winter. Um, we had a coat drive every year and um, uh, that was an interesting approach to stewardship, that time, talent, and treasure. Uh, and we asked people to make a gift in all three areas, make a commitment to serve on a committee, perhaps, and give 50 hours of, uh, of time to that. Um, I remember, uh, this was not a, a program that I tried, but one that maybe is worth contemplating. Uh, I talked with a pastor at Brick Church uh, in New York and Michael Lindvall and, and said, what, what do you do with stewardship that would be interesting uh, to challenge our stewardship committee to do? And he said, well, 
The way we do it at Brick Church is someone who, ma who makes a pledge of $3,000. Um, we ask them to call up someone. We ask them to pledge $3,500 and to call up someone that, that we'll uh, provide you the name of and, and tell them that you're doing that, that you're pledging $3,500 this year and challenging yourself to step up. And uh, I've been asked to call you to ask if you would do the same. So there was a frankness about uh, stewardship and giving that I don't think you find in every Presbyterian church or any, any church in particular, um, but uh, the stewardship committee felt it was really important that people get some idea of what we're asking um, them to do. Uh, I, I remember there was a, a member at Westminster, a DuPonter, who uh, said, just, John, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Well, I don't think that's a very good stewardship program. Um, but I think being frank about uh, money and about the needs of the church and challenges of the church are something that, um, that we have to take seriously. Um, looking at my notes to see... Uh, No, I, I don't, I can't read my own writing. So uh, anyway, um, those are a couple of thoughts. I, I remember um, you, know, you asked me a question about what First and Central could do um, in this time. I remember when Fourth Church in Chicago, a mile uh, across the street from um, uh, blooming tales. Um, they were looking for a pastor at the time that uh, John Buchanan was being called there. And they had a, uh, um, a search committee that met with uh, some of the corporate leadership across the street and up and down the street and around uh, and uh, around the church and asked them, what do you know about First Church? What is your impression of First Church? And um, could you tell us what you need us to do or be for you? Um, here, is, um, here is First and Central across the street from uh, some of the corporate leadership, um, some of the premier corporate leadership uh, in Wilmington, and it it might be worth a conversation uh, with uh, some of those folks to say, "What well, we're we're your neighbor. We're on the street here, sharing this block with you. What can we be doing to be supportive of your work and you to be supportive of ours? Uh, what kind of relationship would be most meaningful for you? And see what that." what that brings. I remember there was a Philadelphia church that I know very well. And uh, at the time they were looking for their pastor, they did a survey of the neighborhood, just really knocking on doors, um, stopping by cafe tables to talk with people, things like that. And they asked, uh, what's your impression of our church? And they said, oh, that's the church that put out some geraniums uh, at, uh, in the springtime. But other than that, I don't know anything about them. Um, well, uh, the, the church took that on as a challenge that the next time that they do, did that, they would somehow have um, something more to say about that particular congregation than that they had geraniums that weren't very well watered and eventually died out by summertime. <laughs> These are, anyway. You've given us some fantastic ideas, John, thank you. And I'm mindful of the time. And, um, and so I wanna, wanna see if there's any questions at this point. I saw, I thought I saw Nita raising her hand but maybe she was waving goodbye because now I don't see her. But um, anybody else have any questions for John right now? 
Noble has a question. Yes, John, you mentioned uh, diversity in your congregation regarding age. You did not mention racial uh, diversity. Did you have racial diversity there? If so, how did you achieve it? How did you maintain it? And what might you advise us at, at First and Central as we look forward to uh, what comes next? Uh, I was so fortunate uh, mm -hmm. in that we had a wonderfully diverse uh, congregation. Now that's the white aged man who's saying that. Um, but we did have Hispanic, Korean, uh, African-American, Caribbean, um, just uh, so many uh, different people from a variety of uh, backgrounds and uh, uh, countries of origin and so on. Uh, I just uh, marveled at that. Now, I put that proviso in saying that um, this is an ancient white man that's speaking. Um, and I, I say that because there could have been more. There could have been more of everything. Um, I, we did a children's prayer. I didn't do a children's uh, story, but we did a children's prayer every Sunday. And I would look at those kids uh, who's sitting on the steps and they were a little United Nations, uh, just amazing that people from such diverse backgrounds would gather at the church on Sunday. And I think that word got out. Um, one of the important things to remember, and I, I say this not in any patronizing way to you, Noble, but it, it, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't accomplish a lot when there are only two or three or four or five um, Korean or African-American or Caribbean folks who are there in the sanctuary. There's some critical mass. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Is it 25? Is it 100? I don't know. Um, but uh, unless there's a critical mass of uh, diversity, people don't notice it as much as they should. And they don't draw in friends and other families. Um, but if their experience is one of welcome, of warmth, of sincerity, of belonging, then I think it makes a big difference. Um, so uh, also if the pastor is African-American or Korean or Hispanic, um, my successor at First Church uh, was raised in Mexico City, so speaks fluent Spanish and is, uh, was born in England. So, <laughs> You know, he's got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and it's uh, wonderful uh, that uh, the congregation has a Spanish-speaking pastor as well as English-speaking pastor in, in, I guess, um, one of the possibilities I would, I mean, I know that there's been a lot of talk about preparing for change, um, and uh, I wonder what would happen if the PNC found that the best candidate uh, is African-American or Hispanic by background, um, and whether there would be a readiness and willingness at First Church, uh, I'm sorry, at First and Central to welcome uh, that new life into the uh, life of the congregation. My hunch is, yes, it would work. Uh, and it would help the congregation grow with the density of people who are in the area around the church. One of the big differences, I think, between First and Central and First Presbyterian is the number of people who are actually living near the church and could walk to the church. Um, I know downtown has had some, um, some change and some growth and some, um, and yet, uh, uh, not far away is a, a large uh, uh, 
growth for the congregation if, if in fact the congregation does want to grow. Uh, that's a challenge though. And finding that critical mass, I think would be um, a big step towards uh, helping the congregation uh, increase in numbers and strength. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Ryan has a question. I was just, um, so thank you, John, for everything you shared. And I was just curious about what attracts you to First and Central and what, I mean, you've, you've sort of touched on this, but if there are particular strengths of First and Central that you think we should really lean into? Well, of course you, I mean, here I was retiring after 17 years in New York and looking for a congregation. Um, as you know, uh, I, I assume you know that um, a pastor signs an agreement uh, when he or she leaves uh, a church that they will not uh, perform pastoral duties uh, in the congregation they've served in. So that exiles me from First Church in New York, uh, not that I would get up there on, on too many Sundays. And it also exiles me a bit from Westminster, although uh, Greg Jones, who's been there now for 20 years, I think, 18, 19 years, um, I think that probably the coast is clear. I could go back to Westminster, but um, you know, uh, I have to work if I go there because people don't know me as just John Walton. They know me as their former pastor. And um, so it's like running into your retired doctor. Um, Gee, doc, I've got this pain in my side and, and the doctor really just wants to be friends at this point. Um, I came for the music. I came for good preaching. I came because of Casey. Um, I came uh, because the liturgy is gorgeous. Uh, and it spoke to me in a powerful, powerful way. I don't know who's responsible for that. Um, perhaps it was all three uh, of the leaders in worship. Um, uh, Doug, Casey, and um, David, but um, it all blended so beautifully. I would come home on Sundays and just be floating, thinking, wow, this is the way church should be. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess I'm one of the people who would love to have it go back to being the same way. Um, the Gorgeous music is still there. Um, David is such a gift to the to the um, church, and I hope he keeps on playing a long, long time. The choir is wonderful. Um, a preacher of Doug's quality and avail uh, ability is is I think very necessary, and um, I miss that youthfulness that Casey brought. Um, she, um, I love those red shoes. I loved her brass, you know, I loved her cheekiness. She just uh, really fit the bill for me, um, having been around young adults uh, and young professionals in New York. Um, she just uh, struck me as, and she's also, also an Austin Seminary graduate. And while I have no connection other than knowing Ted Wardlaw, who's the president there, he thought very highly of Casey as well. And, and um, so that was just an added boost. But I think uh, First and Central is doing so many things right um, that uh, I couldn't settle on just one thing that has me interested in its present and its future. But uh, I, I really, really love, and I, and I love the congregation. Um, such open, friendly, warm, um, but not transgressive uh, congregation. Um, people allow you to just kind of come in and, and do what you'd like to do in worship and, and leave if that's what you'd like to do. And I think that's the mark of a sophisticated urban church um, that 
while everyone would love to get to know you, uh, if you need to keep to yourself, you can do that. Uh, I think a church, a church like First and Central can provide that, while at the same time building a community of uh, belonging and of warmth and friendship. This has been wonderful, John. Uh, thank you so much. I, I'm looking at the time and wondering if, if we have one more question. Um, looks like David Teeger, why don't you be our last person and uh, then we'll close. Uh, in, in, in fact, that was the other hand raise. That was the applause. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, well. I could, I, I sense that I could spend hours talking to, uh, to John about other subjects that weren't touched on here, but I think uh, before we open up the next um, box of gifts that he has to offer and uh, words of wisdom, it's probably best that I keep quiet. <laughs> Thank, thanks, David. Uh, and let me just uh, add an apology for my antiquarian um, uh, laptop, which I don't know, for some reason will not let me come to the forum uh, until at least 10 minutes have uh, passed. And I'm sure it couldn't possibly be this uh, ancient uh, man, this ancient mariner who doesn't know how to operate his uh, computer. But Zoom doesn't like me, I don't know. <laughs> I think we all have been challenged by Zoom and all the other uh, options that we've had to use over this past year. but. You persevered and we are so, so grateful. And Ellen, you have done an amazing job for yes. all through the year, but especially these last five weeks with the clergy conversations. Thank you for your, Thank you. your gifts. So this has been a, a wonderful season of uh, Explorers Forum since September and Noble, I promise you that we will be working diligently over the summer so that uh, we return with stimulating and inspiring and challenging uh, topics. And we do invite your suggestions and leadership as Margaret Ann said. So thank you everyone. We'll look forward to seeing you hopefully in church next Sunday at 10 o'clock um, as we start our summer worship series. So, <laughs> Thanks, Everyone, John. thank, thank you. you. Go in thank peace. You, John. Thank, thank you all. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. <laughs>